Well, good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure for me to stay here with you to today. I'm sorry this talk uh, would be given online, as I would have been liked very much to be in presence, but unfortunately, this is the schedule for me. The talk is entitled uh, Risks Empowered Raiders and aims to present some recent advances concerning the usage of an RIS in conjunction with radar systems. The authors are myself, Emanuele Grossi, and my colleague Luca Venturino. And we will alternate each other uh, in this talk. This is um, not uh, really so brief uh, outline of the seminar. Specifically, we will start by recalling uh, the basic facts about RIS, uh, RIS and radars. Then we will show the benefits that RIS can provide in radar systems, both in the case that the RIS is placed in close proximity of the radar, and in this case, uh, uh, in this situation, the RIS elaborates the radar signal to help the radar function and also in the case where they are widely separated. Subsequently, we will show how the RIS can be effectively, effectively used to sustain a communication by exploiting the signal emitted by a legacy radar system. In this case, the RIS uses the radar signal to help the communication function. Finally, some concluding remarks will be given. So let us start by recalling some facts about RIS. I'm sure that all of you knows very well this topic, so I will be very quick. RIS has uh, attracted uh, a huge interest from the from the researchers as they allow to realize what is so called the smart radio environments. An RIS is a low-cost, uh, often planar structure made of engineered material with tunable electromagnetic characteristics. Current implementation include the reflect arrays, transmit arrays, liquid crystals, uh, surface, and software-defined metasurfaces. The elements of an, an RIS can be individually controlled by a low-power external logic to redirect the incident electromagnetic wave uh, towards an arbitrary, I would say anomalous, direction or towards a specific location. So this focusing mechanism um, resembles that of a phased array and can enhance the signal reception at the desired destination. The key feature or features are the at that uh, races do not require radio frequency chain and that uh, they are intrinsically full duplex. Also, due to the low footprint, they can easily be deployed in uh, the environment with uh, an affordable cost. Races can also be, can be passive, or better, we will say nearly boss passive, in which case they can just redirect the incident wave, or active, in which case they can they are able to amplify and redirect the incident wave for example to compensate the two hope attenuation in a ris operated link in the past few years ris have been mainly investigated in wireless communications to enhance the network performance in terms of example gracia received as an r uh, error probability, transmission rate. They have been also used to provide uh, a non line of sight channel so as to be able to reach destinations that otherwise would have been obstructed or to improve user localization or joint communication and localization in mobile networks. Finally, they have been studied in the context of wireless panelist power transfer, antenna design, and coverage extension. More recently, researchers have started investigating also the benefits that RIS can provide in radar systems 
And this talk aims to present some of the recent advances in this context. So in the following, we, I will first show the advantages of using uh, RIS to improve the performance of other systems when the radar and the RIS are closely separated and when they are widely separated. And then we will show how an RIS can be effectively exploited in ambient scatter communications where the ambient signal is the one emitted by, rad by radar. But before to proceed, I will, however, spend a few more slides to recall some basic facts and basic principles of radar, just to be more familiar to this, in, to this field. Uh, this figure shows the working principle of a simple monostatic radar. The term monostatic refers to the fact that the transmitter and the receiver are co-located. Uh, well, in this figure, they also share the same antenna, but they can also have dedicated antennas. The transmitter emits a signal, which is usually a pulse train, with a waveform, uh, with a wavelength lambda, bandwidth W, and duration T. And the receiver elaborates the echo signal generated by a target, if a target is present. The echo is clearly received after two seconds, and it has a Doppler shift FD. Well, denoting C, the speed of light, we have that C times U times tau is the dis distance traveled by the wave to reach the target and get back to the radar. So the range to the target is just C times tau divided by 2. And this is the measurement range that a radar usually take. The accuracy, accuracy of the range measurement is related to the accuracy we can uh, measure the delay that is in turn determined by the signal bandwidth. We indeed need a large bandwidth to have a small error in the delay estimation process. So the uncertainty in the um, range me measurement is just C divided by 2W. The radial velocity is measured instead by using the Doppler effect. The total phase change in the two-way propagation path is 2 pi times the twice the range divided by lambda. The Doppler frequency is obtained by dividing uh, 2 pi this quantity and differentiating this phase change with respect to the time. If we do this, we just obtain this relationship here, which is the standard relationship that relates the velocity and the Doppler frequency. The in particular, the velocity is the Doppler frequency times by multiplied by the wavelength lambda divided by 2. This is another measurement that radars usually take. This, I, I want just to recall you that this is the radial velocity, also called range rate since what is count here is the distance, relative distance between the radar and the target. The accuracy uh, uh, in the velocity measurement is related to the accuracy we can measure the frequency. And it is widely known that a large duration allow a low uncertainty or a small error in the frequency measurement. So the uncertainty in the velocity measurement is therefore lambda divided by 2 to t, which is the total signal duration. Finally, the antenna pointing angle gives us the angle measurements of the target, and the antenna beam width gives us the error or the accuracy at which we are able to measure this uh, quantities. Another important uh, 
uh, uh, fact about radar radars is that the, the so-called radar equation. This is just a uh, power uh, link budget. In particular, the power density at range R from a directed antenna is simply the transmit power multiplied by the gain of the transmit antenna and then divided by 4 pi R squared, the range to the target squared. This is simply the measure, the surface area of a, of a surface centered at the reader and with radius equal to the range to the target. The radiated power density back at the target is just a fraction of this density and is given by this previous density multiplied by the radar cross section which is a measure a function of the effective area of the target and that divided by two, 4 pi r squared to account for the free space path loss back to the radar sigma as i told you is the radar cross section is a very important parameter and as a units of measures units of area but is uh, mainly determined by the um, shape of the object by the material of the object and also by its physical extension the received power at the radar is then this power density multiplied by the effective area of the receive antenna but as all of you knows the effective area is related to the gain of the receive antenna by this standard relationship and if you plug this in this previous equation you get the receive radar power as i told you in before this is just a link power link budget but it's important to notice that the difference between the communications is that here we have the fourth power of the range and also that only a fraction of the power is redirected back to the transmitter and who is responsible to that is the radar cross section so this the small radar cross section and this uh, the four uh, the fourth power of the range in the free space path lots determines uh, one of the key characteristics of the radar signal a very very low signal power very low signal levels let us now talk about the antenna field the space surrounding the antenna is usually subdivided into two regions the near field and the far field regions the near field can in, be in turn subdivided in the reactive near field and the radiating near field. In the far field, the electric and magnetic fields vary with the radial distance as e to the minus 2 pi i r divided by lambda divided by r. So this is basically the uh, coefficient that characterizes a spherical wave factor. This is a, a spherical, just a spherical wave factor times uh, a function that is only dependent of the angular coordinates. And these regions extend from this point on, and this point is standard in, uh, in antenna field and is given by 2d squared by lambda, where d is the physical size of the antenna. These other two terms in the maximum are necessary to account for the case where the dimension of the antenna, antenna is comparable with the wavelength. Another aspect very important is the concept of narrowband or wideband signals. This is very important in array processing. In particular, a signal is said to be narrowband if the largest time difference of arrival or, or, or departure between all the signals received in all the elements of the array sorry guys I touched the screen which is touch are not resolvable clearly since the resolution in time is dictated by the inverse of the bandwidth 
the condition for the time delays not being resolvable is that this difference here is much less than the inverse of the bandwidth for all the angle of arrivals. If you multiply both sides of this equation by this, the velocity of light, the, the, the speed of light, you get that the maximum distance, which is this one, and it is equal to d, the size of the antenna, should be much less than c divided by w. This will be an important parameter in the future developments. A signal is instead said to be wideband if it is not narrowband. The last important definition I would like to report here is that concerning widely separated and closely separated antennas. The radar red reflects parts of the incident wave back to the radar. Therefore, if we see the target as an antenna of aperture equal to its size, let's say D, the target scattering can be modeled through a beam of angular width equal to lambda divided by D. Thus, if we let theta denote the angle between the line joining antenna 1 and the target, line segment joining antenna 1 and, and, and the target, and the line seg segment joining antenna 2 and the target, we have that um, if theta is greater than lambda divided by d, the target beam width cannot illuminate the two sensors simultaneously. In this case, we have uncorrelated scattering, that is, angular diversity. This case is, is denoted as widely spaced antennas. In the closely spaced case, instead, theta is much smaller than the beam width of the target scattering, lambda by d, and in this case, the two sensors, let's say c, the same tar the target from the same aspect angle. So, this ends the first uh, part of the presentation introduction. So, I will give the stage to my colleague Luca Venturino for continuing the presentation. Uh, Luca, you are muted. Sorry about that. Uh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so hello everyone. Uh, it is also a pleasure for me to, to be here and uh, uh, give this talk together with my colleague Emanuele. So I will uh, uh, proceed by uh, introducing the use of uh, RIS uh, in the context of a radar system by uh, assuming that we can deploy this RIS in close proximity of the radar transmitter or the radar receiver. So the, the question we would like to answer is how a closely spaced RIS can actually help a radar. So what we know is that uh, an RIS can in general be used to boost a wireless link, where by wireless link, I mean a link from a given source to a given destination. Uh, we know that whenever we put an RIS in between a source and a destination, one of the major issues we have 
is the fact that we get a multiplicative path loss, which means that we first have to compute the path loss from the source to the RIS. And then we have to compute the path loss from the RIS to the destination. And then finally, we have to multiply together these two losses. And uh, uh, this problem actually gets worse in the context of a radar system, because as we know, uh, in the radar system, as Emmanuel has explained, we actually have the cascade of two wireless links. So we first have to go from the radar transmitter to the prospective target. And then we have to go back from the prospective target to the radar receiver. But well, the question is uh, where we can place an RIS. Well, uh, if we want to reduce the multiplicative path loss, what we know is that the RIS should be better close either to the source or to the destination. In our context, this means that the RIS should be close to the radar transmitter or to the target or to the radar receiver. The main point here is that the target location may not be under our control. And indeed, we may not even know if a target is present or not when we have to solve the detection problem. So uh, what is usually done is to uh, place the RIS in close proximity of the radar transmitter or the radar receiver, or both, if we can afford to have two RIS. So the idea is that uh, existing radars, such, such as those which we employ for air traffic control, coast, coastal control, or marine surveillance, can be uh, aided by nearby RIS, which, for example, can be deployed on the same structure hosting the radar itself, or we can uh, deploy them on the on a building or a wall which is nearby, or can be placed on the ground if our goal is actually to inspect the sky. So we can use uh, an RIS placed on the ground as a mirror to point toward the sky. Also, uh, if we uh, consider uh, applications where we have wireless access point with integrated radar and communication capabilities, we can actually reuse the same reflective surface to support both functions. So this is the, the main picture. So I would like to start by introducing some examples of possible system geometries that we can, uh, we can have. So in this, uh, in this slide on, on, the on the left side, you actually see an example of bi-static configuration, whereby bi-static, I mean that the radar transmitter and the radar receiver are well separated and in this configuration, we can uh, uh, deploy uh, an RIS close to the radar transmitter. We call it forward RIS. This RIS can help the radar transmitter to illuminate a prospective target. And along the same line, we can place a backward RIS in close proximity of the radar receiver in order to uh, capture a larger amount of power uh, radiated back from the target. So in this scenario, what is important to notice is that there is actually an existing line of sight uh, link between the radar transmitter and the target. Therefore, the forward RIS actually provide an additional path to illuminate the target. And uh, in the same way, the backward RIS helps the radar receiver, which has already a direct view of the target. So the, the main issue in this setup is how the additional links provided by the forward RIS and the back, backward RIS can help an existing radar, which has already a direct view of the target. Uh, this same configuration can be specialized to what you have on the right, 
uh, which is a monostatic configuration where the radar transmitter is... Luca, Luca sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. There is a question from Masood. Masood, yes. please go ahead. Uh, sorry to go. Uh, I have one question. Uh, how do you want to estimate the channel for the radar in this scenario? What do you if, mean? How do you want to estimate the channel? If you want, if you want to use the RIS for the radar scenario and target, you have to know the channels. Okay. Which channel? Channel between the RIS and target and radar and target to align the phase to. Well, I mean, uh, we will get to this later, but actually here. We, our goal is to understand whether there is a target or not, okay? So uh, the target response is of course unknown because if we knew the target response, would means that we know that target is there and there is exactly. no problem to be solved, okay? Exactly. So that's a good point. So this is one of the major differences between the radar problem and the communication problem. In the radar problem, uh, when we want to solve a detection problem, we don't even know if the target is there. And if the target is there, we don't know its response. Okay, so we will get back to Thank this uh, later. Okay, Thank now you. this is just a high level description of some possible configurations that we have. Thank you. Okay, so on the right side of this slide, we have a similar setup, except for the fact that the radar transmitter and the radar receiver are co-located. So in this case, uh, we can uh, still have a forward and or a backward RAS, which are helping uh, either the radar transmitter or the radar receiver or both. Now, another interesting setup is the one I'm showing you here, where uh, we don't have line of sight, a line of sight path between the radar and the target. For example, when we look at the configuration on the left, the radar transmitter can only observe the target by using the forward RIS. In this case, we can use the forward RIS to actually extend the field of view of an existing radar which means that we can point toward directions that would have been otherwise not reachable by the radar alone. Uh, in this configuration here on the left, we are assuming that the radar receiver still has a direct view of the target, but if we go on the configuration on the right, here we have the other extreme where neither the radar transmitter nor the radar receiver can directly observe the target. And therefore we use an RIS to uh, search for such a prospective target. Uh, what I would like to point out is that the configuration D that you see here may also be interesting because uh, it can be used to actually replace an expensive radar transceiver with a low-cost device where the radar transmitter just becomes a feeder which is used to illuminate uh, a reconfigurable intelligent surface which is used to scan the area. And uh, the same surface can redirect the echo from the target toward a simple receiver. So we can actually uh, take a look. Luca, sorry to interrupt you again. There is another question. Okay, please go. Um, so, so sorry about this. So um, after the, this part, uh, we're going to go to some technical mathematical details and stuff, right? So, yes. Okay, in that case, uh, it would be a nice point to ask this. Uh, well, in the previous uh, slides, you had said that um, uh, one application for this is uh, like for, for RAS and radar is in air traffic control, right? Um, for example, uh, what would you like? Uh, what what would you imagine uh, like in terms of that? Like, uh, what kind of a system would you uh, uh, 
uh, draw uh, as a picture in your mind? Well, uh, the, 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 the picture we have in mind is just you take an existing radar and you uh, upgrade its performance by deploying an RAS close by. Well, that's one possibility. So you don't need to change what is already there, but you upgrade the existing um, uh, transceiver. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's now uh, get into some more details about this system uh, scenario. So from now on, I will focus on the by static configuration that you see here, where we have this radar transmitter, which wants to illuminate a target with the help of a forward RIS. And you have a radar receiver, which wants to uh, listen to the echo generated from the target. And we have the help of the backward RIS. Uh, this is the, as I will show you later, is the most general system configuration. And all the other configurations that we have seen before can be obtained as a special case uh, by just tuning some of the system parameters that we are going to introduce. So which are our design assumptions? So let's start from the underlying radar. So what we assume here is to have uh, a, a standard MIMO radar. So we have a transmitter with multiple antennas and a receiver with multiple antennas as well. So just any existing MIMO radar. Uh, we also assume that we uh, emit orthogonal narrowband waveforms from the transmit antennas, which is another common uh, operating mode of existing radars. Uh, in our model, we will neglect any possible coupling among the elements of the radar antennas at both the transmit and receive side and among the uh, reflective elements of the RIS. This is a simplification which allows us to get some uh, simple model and allow us to get some uh, achievable performance for the, the, the system. And of course, including these effects into the model is a future development, which is still an open problem right now. Now, uh, we assume that the target here is in the far field of both the radar transmitter and the forward RIS, and also is in the far field of both the radar receiver and the backward RIS, okay? So target is in the far field. We also assume that uh, at the transmit side, the, the pair of RIS and radar transmitter here sees the same aspect angle of the target, which means that from the point of view of the target, both the radar transmitter and the forward RIS are closely spaced. So that's the focus of this part of the presentation, assuming that the RIS and the radar are closely spaced which means that they observe the same aspect angle of the target. Same assumption is made at the receiver side. Finally, uh, we assume that the RIS and the radar can either be in the near field or in the far field. So we keep this assumption general, okay? And as we will see, uh, the achievable performance can be much different if we can if we can reduce the distance between the RAS and the radar. And I will give you some uh, details on this uh, later. So what I want to point out here is only the target is in the far field of the radar, not the RIS. 
So let me introduce some simple notation that we may need in the following slides. So here uh, we will um, use the 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 critical marks over bar and double dots to distinguish between the transmit and the receiver side. This mimic what you have here in the figure. So we have this solid line describing what you have at the transmit side, and you have this dot line for what you have on the receive side. So we denote by n the number of antennas, and uh, uh, we use the subscript R and the subscript S to distinguish between the radar and the RIS. So if I take N with the subscript R and the diacritical mark over bar, I'm, use, I'm considering the number of antennas at the radar transmitter. Okay. If I have the subscript S, I have the number of elements at the forward RIS. That's the, the logic behind this notation. Then we need to introduce some other geometrical parameter. D is the range of the target from the reference element of our array. Theta adds and theta L are the corresponding azimuth and elevation. Again, depending on the diacritical mark and the subscript, we may refer to the transmit side, receiver side, the RIS, or the radar transmitter. Okay. Uh, we the pair of azimuth and elevation angle uh, can be denoted by just theta, without any superscript. That's just a short end notation that we will use. So, is there any question here on this? Okay. Um, sorry, I have one question. Um, if you uh, go back to the uh, main setup, so um, uh, when you consider the path, uh, like how, how do you model the uh, short channel between the radar transmitter and the forward RIS? Uh, that's the first question. Yeah, I will. I will show this later. Uh, okay. So, okay. Uh, could you open the notation again? case mm -hmm. um so so uh, based on the azimuth and elevation ang angles uh, like angle of departures angle of uh, arrivals like uh, uh theta s uh, and theta r bars and double dots um are we uh, intending to uh estimate the position of this target like we would like to deduce uh the where this target is right based on the angles and the distance. No, this, basically, these angles correspond to the location of the space you are looking at. And mm -hmm. your goal is to understand whether in that location there is a target or not. Oh, OK. So we are scanning, actually. You are scanning, right? Mm -hmm. okay. And the tar uh, and the tar for the target, uh, the the transmitter and the forward wrist uh, experience the same aspect angle, and on the other hand, the receiver and the uh, backward wrist experience a different same angle, right? Aspect angle. So, okay, uh, if I have understood your point, so uh, at the transmit side here, both RIS and the radar transmitter sees the same aspect angle of the target. At the receiver side, the pair of radar receiver and backward RIS see the same aspect angle, which of course is different from what you have the transmit side. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 Yes, that was. A, uh, I the reason wanted... why it's different is that we have a bi-static configuration. Yes, because like they have very different it, locations. Yes, for a monostatic configuration, you will have the same aspect angle both at the transmit side and the mm -hmm. receiver. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, here I introduce a few other parameters. Those are the last ones, which we need to describe later the channel between the radar transmitter and the forward RIS. 
and similarly the, the channel between the radar receiver and the backward RIS. So what parameters we need here? So take for example the transmit side. So you fix the J radar element and you fix the N RIS element. What you need to do is to define the distance between them, and this is denoted by delta. Then you have to define the azimuth and elevation angle of departure, and those are denoted by rho here. And then we have to introduce the azimuth and elevation angle of arrival, which are denoted by omega here. Now, let's see which is the input-output model when we look at a given direction in the sky. So, the receipt signal is the note by R. Of course, we have here the added noise, W. And uh, whatever you see here is the echo that you get from a prospective target if such a target is present. Okay. I want to underline that we don't actually know if the target is present or not. And in fact, later on, we are going to formulate a binary detection problem, which is the problem we want to solve. So let's assume for the moment that a target is present. So we denote by alpha the unknown target response, which account for the radar cross section of the target, which Emanuele has explained to you before. Then what we have here is the effect of the different paths from the radar transmitter toward the target back to the radar receiver. So in particular, if we start from the radar transmitter, we have a first direct path going from here to the target. And uh, up to a scaling factor, what we have here is the steering vector of the radar array in the direction of the target. It is denoted by V sub R. And we use the over bar because we are at the transmit side. On the other hand, we can reach the target going from the radar transmitter to the RIS. And the channel here is denoted by G bar. At RAS, we know that we can tune the phase response. And uh, in the vector X bar, we include the response of all the elements of the RAS. And then we can go from the RAS toward the target. And uh, the corresponding channel is up to a scaling factor in the form of a steering vector from RAS toward the target. What I want to point out is that these two steering vector BR and BS are given, sorry, are given once you know the geometry of these arrays at the radar transmitter and at the RAS. Clearly, the direct path and the indirect path will have a different path loss and they will have a different phase delay. And we can include this quantity into the coefficient gamma r and gamma s here. So overall, at the transmit side, we have two links reaching the radar, uh, reaching the target. And these two links are combined through this coefficient gamma. At the receiver side, we have a specular situation because we have two indirect links going from the target toward the radar. 
One is the direct link, and the other one is the indirect link. And the notation is similar, except that now we have double dots because we are at the receive side. So one main point is what do we know here and what we don't know here? So as I told you before, we don't know the target response alpha. So this is something that we don't know. What we can assume known is the channel between the radar and the RIS, both at the transmit side and at the receiver side. This is because this channel can be estimated. And uh, once we deploy the radio transmitter and once we deploy the RIS, this channel uh, can, be, uh, can, be, can, can, can be estimated. And in most cases, will not vary much over time unless there are close moving objects, which may not be the case uh, in most radar applications. Also, this coefficient gammas, as, we, as I, will, I will show you later, are related to the propagation model that we have. So once we uh, assume free space propagation, they are also known quantities. So let me give you some more detail about this Kronecker problem here. This Kronecker problem actually can be regarded as a virtual steering vector. And depending on how we choose the coefficients gamma, we can have different configurations, as I show in this table here. So let me start with the case where no RIS is present. So when there is no RIS at the transmit side, this term is not present. When there is no RIS at the receiver side, this, present, this term is not present, which means that the coefficients gamma s are zero. So we are in this table on this row here. So the radar is observed only by the radar. And this is the standard MIMO system. In this case, the virtual steering vector of a standard MIMO, a standard MIMO radar is the connected product of the steering vector at the transmit side and the steering vector at the receive side. When we include the RIS in the model, we are modifying the transmit steering vector because we are adding an additional link. Similarly, we are modifying the receive steering vector because we are adding another link. And uh, of course, we could decide to place the RIS only at the transmit side, which means that this gamma S with the double dots will be zero or we can only place the RIS at the receive side, which means that this gamma S with the over bar will be zero. Also, if the radar is a non-line of sight radar, we may even not have this uh, path from the radar transmitter to the target, and this path from the target to the radar receiver. So as you can see, different configurations can be accommodated in this general model by just changing the value of, uh, by, by just, play, uh, just putting these coefficient gammas to zero as depending on the configuration we want. Uh, here is the channel model that we have been considering uh, in the, uh, in this uh, in this work and that we have used in our analysis. So basically as to gamma R at the transmit side, we simply consider the uh, standard radar equation. So we have that the amplitude of this coefficient is the square root of what? So we have the gain of the, uh, uh, the element gain of the radar transmitter in the direction of the target. 
divide by 4 pi times the square distance from uh, the radar array toward the target. And then we have this phase delay, which depends, of course, on the distance and on the wavelength. Similar assumption is made for gamma s, but uh, what is important here to, 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 to notice is that we need to, we, we have here two paths. We first go from the radar transmitter toward the RIS, and then we have the response of each uh, of the, uh, of the uh, element of the RIS. And in the denominator, we have the square distance between the radar transmitter and the RIS and the square distance between the RIS and the target. So we have this multiplicative path loss effect. And again, we have the phase delay, which accounts for the overall distance from the radar transmitter to the RIS to the target. As to the channel between the uh, radar transmitter and the RIS, we uh, consider a similar uh, free space propagation model. A few words about the uh, response of each element of the RIS. So here we model the response in terms of the radar cross section which the element offer to the incident wave that uh, hit the element itself. This radar cross section can be modeled as the product of an effective receive aperture and a transmit gain. And a widely used model is the one where we assume a cosine shape scan loss in both azimuth and elevation. So as you can see here, if we denote by A the area of the element, the effective receive aperture is uh, A times this uh, term here accounting for the cosine shape scan loss. Sometimes we also add a, a power factor Q here, which can be tuned based on the uh, uh, actual uh, physical properties of the RIS we are using. And uh, this is the effective receive aperture. And of course, we can have the uh, corresponding transmit gain here. So we now move to uh, the problem of designing the radar detector and uh, the problem to optimizing the RIS to uh, improve the radar performance. So as I mentioned you before, the radar detector aims to discriminate between the target presence, which is for us the hypothesis H1, and its alternative, which is for us the hypothesis H0. So we resort here to uh, a generalized likelihood ratio test. What is a generalized likelihood ratio test? So basically, uh, we consider the probability density function of the received signal under the hypothesis H1, which is denoted here by F sub 1. And uh, we consider then the probability density function of the received signal under the hypothesis H0, which is denoted here by F0. And we take the ratio between these two densities. But the problem here is that under H1, the target response is unknown. So since this target response is unknown, we replace this unknown response by the maximum likelihood estimation, which means that we maximize the probability density function under H1 over alpha. And then we take the ratio between these two density after after having replaced alpha with its ml estimation then we take the log which is just 
uh, a standard transformation. And uh, after taking these operations, we end up with this simple test statistic. So let me give you some more information about this test statistic. So R is the signal R we are receiving. E here is, as we have seen before, the virtual steering vector of the target. So this virtual steering vector, of course, depends upon the response of the RIS and also depend upon the location we are expecting. So what we do here is basically project the received signal along the virtual steering vector. Then we normalize what we get by the noise standard deviation. And finally, we compute the square magnitude. And this is what we uh, compare against a threshold eta. If we have a threshold crossing, we declare the presence of target. If we don't have a threshold crossing, we declare the absence of the target. So uh, if we play a bit with this test statistic, uh, we can easily see that uh, thanks to the adopted normalizations, uh, under H0, what we have is just a complex Gaussian uh, random variable with zero mean and unit variance. So we have a standard complex Gaussian random variable. Under H1, we have the same complex Gaussian random variable with zero mean and unit variance plus the signal term here. So if we exploit these properties of the test statistic, we can actually get a closed form expression for the probability of false alarm and for for the probability of detection. So let's start with the probability of false alarm. So the probability of false alarm can be easily shown to be e to the power of minus eta. So what we can do here is to select our threshold in order to have a desired probability of false alarm. Let's say we want to have a probability of false alarm of 10 to minus 4. We select 10 to minus 4 and we derive the corresponding value for the threshold. What is important here to notice is that under H0, H0, the probability of false alarm is independent of the RAS response. So the threshold setting that I have described to you before is independent of how we uh, design our RAS. We can also compute the probability of detection. Clearly, this probability of detection will depend upon which assumption we make on the target response alpha. So if we assume that the target has a non-fluctuating response, then the probability of detection can be written in terms of the Markham Q function. And here, this, the arguments of the Markham Q function are related to the detection threshold eta and uh, the received signal to noise ratio where the signal to noise ratio is just the square norm of our virtual steering vector times average strength of the target the sigma squared alpha and the power of the noise sigma squared w if we instead we have the classical swirling case one model which means that we assume the response of the target to be a complex Gaussian random variable, we obtain a different expression for the probability of detection, which again is a function of gamma and SNR, which is defined as before. The last case that I'm showing you here is the Swellings case three, which means that we make a chi-square assumption for the response alpha, where the chi-square has four degrees of freedom. Luca, sorry to interrupt you, just uh, to point out uh, a typo. The threshold is always uh, eta or uh, gamma, it's the, just the same. Yeah, okay. Just to sorry. be okay. consistent. So, what sorry. What you here, gamma is eta. Sorry about that. Well, here is eta, and here is eta. Thanks, Emmanuel. 
So what I want to point out here are two things. First, uh, for these three different models, we always see that given the threshold eta, the probability of detection will be an increasing function of the signal to noise ratio. So if we want to maximize the probability of detection, we actually need to maximize the signal to noise ratio. And uh, this brings us to the problem of optimizing the RIS. The signal to noise ratio, as you see here, is a function of the, squ uh, the square norm of the virtual stealing vector of the target. The virtual stealing vector can be changed by acting on the reflecting elements of the RIS at the transmit side and at the receive side. So our goal is to maximize this signal to noise ratio, which is tantamount to maximize the square norm of the virtual steering vector. So we can formulate the RIS design problem as the maximization of the square norm of the virtual steering vector. So the good thing is that since this virtual steering vector is in the form of a connected product, when we take this square norm, we actually have the square norm of the virtual transmit steering vector times the square norm of the virtual receive steering vector. Of course, we need to include some constraint about the elements of the vector x bar and x double dots. Since here we are assuming a passive RES, we have the usual constraint that the response should have unit magnitude on each element. And this is what you see here in the constraint. So our goal is to design the response of the transmit RIS X bar and the response of the receive RIS X double dots. So luckily, this problem is separable. So we can independently optimize the transmit RIS and the receive RIS. And the corresponding two subproblems are shown here at the bottom of the slide. That's the first good news. There is actually another important good news. So the RIS design is actually independent of the target strength and the noise strength. So remember, the target strength is sigma squared alpha, which may not be known in our problem. And also, it is independent of the NOS strength, sigma squared W. So once we have our design for the RIS, this design will not be, as, uh, uh, must not be updated if the target strength changes or if the noise strength changes. So, how can we solve this problem? Well, let's consider the optimization of the transmit RIS. So we solve this problem. The other one is specular. So it is solved along the same lines. Uh, we have to distinguish two operating regimes. So let's first consider the case where the RIS and the radar are in the each other far field. If this is the case, the channel matrix G between the RIS and the radar is a rank one matrix, which means that we can write it in the form of a steering vector GR of the radar transmitter toward the forward RIS times the steering vector GS transpose, which is the steering vector of the forward RIS toward the radar transmitter. So if we plug this rank one decomposition into our 
objective function here, uh, it's not difficult to show that we have actually a closed form expression for the optimal phase design. And uh, what this optimal design must do is to first phase the line this term here, and then make sure that this the steering vector VR, which is the steering vector from the radar toward the target, and the steering vector GR, which is the steering vector from the RIS toward <coughs> Uh, the, 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 the stream vector of the um, radar toward RIS are properly aligned. When we are in a near field deployment, uh, a closed form expression does not appear to exist. So here we can solve the problem at hand in several suboptimal ways. For example, we can do an alternate maximization over the uh, search variables. And in this case, you can verify that each subproblem admits a closed form solution. Or we can have a convex relaxation, which can be solved by a standard numerical uh, tools. So uh, I won't bother you with these technical details that you can find in the paper by uh, our uh, by uh, in our paper, which is mentioned at the bottom of the, this slide. Uh, what I want to to do now with you is just uh, presenting some performance analysis to uh, show which are the performance that we can hope to achieve. So in this first example, I am considering a bi-static configuration. So we have a radar transmitter and a radar receiver, which are 10 kilometers far away. And uh, unless otherwise stated, we assume that the target is located in this point here, known by P2. Uh, we assume a color wavelength of 10 centimeters a bandwidth of one megahertz. Then uh, uh, we assume that the transmit array has three elements. The receive radar array has eight elements with half wavelength spacing. Uh, the RAS is a variable number of elements, which is denoted by NS, which is equal at both the transmit side and the receive side. Again, we assume half wavelength spacing. And uh, we denote by delta the distance between the radar transmitter and the forward RIS, which is also equal to the distance between the radar receiver and the backward RIS. And uh, we will uh, investigate the system performance for different values of delta and for different values of NS. So we are going to change the distance between the radar and RIS, and we are going to change the size of the RIS. So let's first consider the figure that you see on the left, OK? So in this figure, what I am reporting here uh, is the SNR gain that you see when you include the RIS in your system as compared to the SNR that you would have without the RIS, just with the radar alone. So for example, if you see an SR gain of 4 dBs, it means that if you add an RIS to an existing radar, you can improve the received SNR by 4 dBs. That's the way we read this SNR gain. On the x-axis, we plot the distance delta between the RIS and the radar transmitter or the radar receiver. Okay. Uh, 
you will see here two line styles. Let's first focus on the solid line style. This is the solution that you get when you uh, actually uh, solve the problem by uh, making no assumption about the fact that the RIS is in the fall field or in the, it's the optimal solution to the problem. Okay. Now we have four lines, the one corresponding to the star marker. This is a system configuration with when the RIS is used at both the transmit side and the receive side. So here the legend radar and RIS means that we have the RIS at the transmit side. Radar and RIS means that we have the RIS at the receive side. The circle marker instead only consider the RIS at the transmit side. The X marker instead only consider the RIS at the receive side. So as you can see, we can get the largest gain when two RIS are employed. And this is not surprising. Uh, what it may be worth to uh, mention is that in this case, in this system configuration, if we should place RIS only at one side of the system, it is better to place it at the transmit side. The explanation is actually simple. If you look at the setup in this slide, and if you remember that the target is located at P2, uh, this point P2 uh, is, uh, can better be reached by the forward RIS rather than the backward RIS because the angle of departures here is more favorable. Remember that the RIS has a better response at the broadside. As you move away toward end fire, the gain of the, uh, that you can get by combining the by properly combining the phase response of all elements reduces. So in this case the forward RIS offer a better gain in the direction P2 rather than the backward RIS. Luca, there is a question yes. at this time. So uh, I got your point that the angle becomes more near to the zero, but at the same time, the distance is increasing here. It's been, uh, for example, for me, the Backward, yeah, this, this, is, this is true. This is a good point. But uh, the, the, the first effect in this specific setup dominates. Okay. Which, which means angle is more important than the distance? In, 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 in this example, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Now, uh, let's look now at the dashed lines that you see here overprinted along the solid lines. So these dashed lines correspond to the solution that you get if you consider the closed form expression under the far field deployment. So if we design the RIS by simply taking this Close form expression that you would have in the far field, what do you get? Well, these are the performance. Of course, when the distance between the RIS and the radar increases, the dashed line converges to the solid line because we, at some point, reach the far field condition. But when the distance delta is small and we are in the near field, the gap between the two gets larger and larger, okay? Another important fact that we see from this figure 
is that if we increase the distance delta between the RIS and the radar, the SNR gain that we get dramatically reduces, which means that the improvement that we can have as compared to the radar operating alone becomes smaller and smaller as delta increases. And of course, a small, a very small SNR gain may not just justify the additional costs that you would have for deploying RIS. So if here we want to really help an existing radar by placing a close by RIS, this close by RIS should be as close as possible. And for sure in the near field of the radar rather than in the far field. A far field deployment is not really rewarding. That's an important lesson. Okay. Uh, now, let me go on the right side of this slide. So we have here another figure. Let's see how to read this other figure. So in this figure, I am assuming that the RAS is placed at both sides of the system, the transmit side and the receive side. When we have such a system configuration, uh, there are four possible paths. So we have one path going from the radar to the target to the radar, which is the solid line. Actually, this is the path that you would have if there is just the radar without the RIS. And uh, we normalize the SNR of this path so that we have all the other paths so that we can, we, we, we can plot the SNR gain of all the other paths. Which are the other paths? Is the one, for example, from the radar to the target, to the RIS, to the radar which is marked with an X. Then we have the one from the radar to the RIS, the target, the radar, which is marked with a circle. So both the X marker and the circle marker corresponds to paths where we bounce only once on the RIS. Finally, we have uh, the path marked with a star where we have two bounces upon the RIS, because we go from the radar to the RIS, to the target, to the RIS again, to the radar. Now, when we look at the strength of each individual path, we see that when the distance delta is very, very small, let's say less than two meters, uh, in this case, these paths are actually stronger than the direct path from the radar to the target the radar. And in this regime, we can actually really benefit from the beam forming gain that we get from the RIS. And if we could use two RIS, it's even better. However, as we increase the distance, the strength of this indirect path rapidly decreases. Because, of course, we have the multiplicative path loss effect along those uh, indirect paths, which have multiple hopes. And uh, the, uh, when we have a double, uh, uh, when we use a double RIS, the, uh, the drop in the SNR is much sharper as compared to the case where we have just one RIS. Because, of course, we have one, uh, we, we have uh, less hopes in the path. Uh, here, I'm also plotting the corresponding, uh, uh, the, the SNR gain corresponding to the superposition of all these four paths, which was the same line that you see in the left line in the left figure here. So now it is shown as a dashed line. So as you can see, when you combine all of them together, 
properly, you can have a gain. And when the distance delta is very small, the large gain that you can see here, about 10 dBs, is mainly due to the fact that we have two indirect paths which are very strong. Uh, now, another point I want to make is about the maximum system bandwidth that we can tolerate here. Remember, at some point, I mentioned that we are assuming narrow band waveforms. And also, uh, in, the, in the first part of this talk, Emanuele mentioned about the relationship between the size of the arrays that we are using and the uh, uh, bandwidth of the waveform. Well, if we want to use a narrow band signal model, we have to make sure that all the elements of the received arrays, uh, I mean, at each element of the receive array, we receive uh, a delayed version of the transmit signal reflected by the target that cannot be resolved in terms of delays. And uh, if we play with the standard narrowband conditions, uh, we see that when we have a radar operating alone, this system can operate with a maximum bandwidth slightly larger than 25 megahertz. But if we introduce in our system the RIS, the maximum bandwidth will inevitably be reduced because the RIS will introduce additional paths from the target to from the radar, from the elements of the transmit array to the target, to the element of the receiver arrays. And uh, we need to reduce the bandwidth to uh, maintain the narrow band assumption. And clearly, if we increase the length of the path between the RIS and the radar, the maximum bandwidth will decrease accordingly. So another reason to have a close by RIS is to uh, use a larger bandwidth in the system. So, look, another question. Yeah. yeah. So, could you explain again this plot why it's decreasing because of the risk? Can why? You uh, can you explain why? <clears throat> the maximum bandwidth decrease based on the distance when we assume we are in the wide band scenario. Uh, can you repeat, can you explain why the bandwidth is decreasing? <laughs> when... Look, I just... alarm... Sorry. I think you understand my question. Uh, I think now we are in the wide band and based on the distance between the rudder and the reefs, the maximum bandwidth, you have to decrease the bandwidth to get the best performance. Why it's happening here? No, I mean, okay. Let me go to this uh, video here. Okay. So, consider the radar transmitter, okay? Yes. And assume that we just have one transmit antenna here and one receive antenna here. So let's make the system very simple. Okay. So from this single transmitter, I go to the target along this path, and then I go to the radar receiver along this path. So this path has a given length, okay? And given this length, you know the propagation delay. Okay. Okay. With different delay, which means based on the bandwidth, no, we have no. different delay for each frequency. Right. For so if I if I if I follow the other path, so from here I go to the RIS, and then I go to the target, and then I go to the target uh, to the to the radar receiver along this path. So this indirect path will be longer. Okay. 
How much longer? Well, it depends on which is the distance between this transmitter here and RIS. The longer the distance here, the longer the delay offset between the direct echo and the indirect echo. Now, if this uh, delay offset is too large, at some point you will be able to resolve it. Okay. okay. So, which is Your good for the solution language. capability is related to the inverse of the bandwidth. So, if you want to increase the delay offset, you need to decrease the bandwidth. And for the radar, the narrowband is better because I assume, for example, if you have multipath, you can get a different delay and you can estimate better or not. It's opposite. I don't know. I don't know if radar it's good or bad. We have multipath with multiple delay, or we just have one strong path with a very low delay. Well, but here I'm not. A, I mean, the, the issue is not about the multipath generated from the environment. Here, this is. We have two paths. One is the path that you have with just the radar alone. Okay, this yeah. other path is created by the RIS. When we create this other path, if we want to maintain the narrowband assumption, we have to make sure that these two paths do not have resolvable delays. Otherwise, this model will not work. OK. OK. Thank you. Uh, so in this other slide, I'm pretty much showing you similar results from a different perspective. So now on the y-axis, I'm still showing you the SNR gain. Uh, the, the same, we have the same legend as before, but on the x-axis, I'm uh, showing the number of elements of the RIS. Here we are assuming that the RIS is a square array with ns element. So uh, the square root of ns is the number of elements along each dimension. So what happened when we increase the number of elements along each dimension? Which means that what happened when we increase the size of the RIS? So it is clear that the larger the RIS, the larger the SNR gain that we can get. And for a fixed distance between the RIS and the radar, which here is four meters, when the RIS is very small, we have far field propagation between them. But when the RIS becomes larger, we move toward near field propagation. And again, in the near field is where we see the largest gains. The figure on the right also is specular to the one we saw before. So we consider the case where the RIS is placed at both the transmit and the receive side. And uh, we uh, show the relative strength of each of the four, each one of the four paths going from the transmitter to the target to the to the reader, and the corresponding superposition. So as you see, when RIS is very small, what is dominating is the direct path from the radar to the target to the reader. But as we increase the size of the RIS, the indirect paths becomes stronger and stronger. And at some point, they will uh, give you a significant uh, boost in terms of system performance, so pretty much as we have seen before. So the, 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 main, the main point here is that the two 
main parameters we can play with are the size of the RIS and the distance between the RIS and the reader. These two parameters are strictly related to each other. Depending on how we choose these two parameters, we can have a near field propagation or a far field propagation between these two guys. And what you want to make sure is that near field condition applies because that's the region where you see most advantages. Okay, this is uh, another, uh, this is uh, another figure where we try to move the position of the target. So let me, let me go back to this, to the system configuration here. So assume that a target moves from point P1, which is here, along this line up to point P3. Overall, we have uh, a segment spanning 20 kilometers. Notice that when we start from P1, P1 is only in the view of the backward RIS, but not in the view of the forward RIS because it's behind the forward RIS. So as we move on the right, at some point, we uh, enter the view of the forward RIS as well. We are in the view of both RIS for a while, and at some point, we exit from the field of view of the backward RIS and we are in the field of view only of the forward RIS. So what we want to do here is to see how the achievable SNR gain changes as we move the position of the target. And this is what we get. So let's consider first what we have on the left. Here, we are considering the case where only a backward RIS is employed. So when we start moving from point P1 toward point P3, uh, you see the SNR gain, which is marked by the dashed line, for now just focus on the dashed line, keep decreasing, keep decreasing, until you have no SNR gain at all, because from this point onward, the backward RIS cannot see the target. And you see that the SNR gain is decreasing because as we move from point P1 to point P2, from here to here, the look angle of the point as to as with respect to the backward RIS changes. And we move from the broad side toward the end file. And as I mentioned you before, uh, as the, this look angle uh, get closer to the end file, you uh, have worse performance because the uh, element gain of the RIS is reduced. Uh, in here, we also have a solid line. What is this solid line? Well, this solid line shows you the performance that you get when instead of optimizing the RIS for the actual target location, you optimize the RIS for a nominal target location in P2. So in P2, Actually, the solid line and the dashed line touches because they are both optimal. But when we move away from P2, you can see that, of course, if you don't have the, uh, a matched design, but you have a mismatched design, you have some losses. But still, you get some gain. So the, the good thing is that even though we are not optimizing the RIS for the actual location we are looking at, we can still get gains, okay? Uh, the center plot is the same as the left plot, but now 
we are using the RIS of the trasimid side, so we have uh, we have similar uh, conclusion as before, and uh, right plot is where we use the RIS at both sides of the system. So clearly, in this case, we can get the largest possible gains. Uh, finally, uh, I want to give you one last example. Uh, which is an example where we use a monostatic system configuration. So we have a radar here. So the transmitter and the receiver of the radar are at the same location. And we have just one RIS, which is helping both during the illumination of the target and during the um, observation of the eco. And the system parameters are similar to the one we have used before. So now what I want to, to show you is how the system performance changes when we change the distance between the radar and the target. So assume that we look at a given direction, okay? And for this given direction, what happens if we change the distance of the target? Now, here you have, again, on the y-axis, we plot the SNR gain as compared to the case where the radar operates alone. The pointing direction is 45 degrees. And the solid line corresponds to the case where you optimize the RIS response for the actual target range reported on the x-axis. And we have different distances between the RIS and the radar of 2 meters, 3 meters, 5 meters. The dot line instead corresponds to the case where the RIS is optimized to uh, look at infinity. So we look at a very far away target, ideally at an infinite distance. Okay. So what we see here is that when the target range is close, is small, there is a big gap between what is the match design which means that we design the, the response of the RIS to focus at some particular point at a given range, or rather to illuminate a target which is an infinite distance. But as the target range increases, these two solutions actually converge, which means that RIS design becomes range independent. And the reason for this is easily explained. So if we see here this figure, uh, imagine the radar and the RIS as a unique array, OK? So if the target is very close, uh, the elements of the RIS are seen as widely spaced from the element of the radar. But if, the, radar, if the, the target range gets larger and larger, at some point, we will see this um, uh, pair of arrays, the one of the RIS and the one of the radar, as a unique large array with co-located element, with closely spaced element as with respect to the radar. And in fact, this region where this happened is marked with a vertical line here. And on the right, we denote the region as co-located region. And this co-located region corresponds to a distance of 2 times d max squared divided by lambda, where d max is the maximum distance between any reflect element and any transmit receive antenna of the radar. So as you can see, when we are in this co-located region, uh, we can uh, we can design the RIS to look at infinity, which means that our design is range independent. 
and uh, uh, this system then will the system design is much simpler. Okay, so I think that uh, uh, we can skip this other couple of slides. And finally, uh, I want to uh, point out some open problems related to what we have seen before. So right now, the main focus has been on the detection problem. Clearly, uh, another important problem is related to the estimation of the unknown parameters. For example, the amplitude, the position, and possibly the Doppler shift. Uh, uh, understanding uh, how the uh, estimation accuracy can be improved is still an open problem. In particular, uh, uh, we should, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, it will be important to compute the performance limits in terms of the kramer raoul lower bounds for this estimation problem. Also, uh, in the initial studies, basically the focus was on the optimization of the RIS partial response but in principle, uh, we can also optimize the radar waveforms. So, so far we are assuming orthogonal waveforms at the transmit side. What if we could optimize also the radar waveforms? So we have a joint optimization involving both RIS partial response and the uh, waveforms radiated by the uh, radar transmitter. Also, uh, as to the RIS, uh, why not introducing a temporal modulation? The reason for that are uh, many. Of course, one uh, one reason for having a, temp a temporal modulation is possibly embedding information. But uh, in the context of uh, radar detection and estimation, a temporal modulation could also be used to allow space-time adaptive processing, which is uh, uh, could be very uh, a very promising field because right now uh, there are no words addressing space time adapting processing for uh, RIS assisted radar. Also, uh, so far the focus was on single targets. Uh, possible extension are with multiple targets, and uh, another important uh, issue is also related to the presence of clutter. So. Uh, when we use an RIS, an RIS, uh, of course, we know can provide a, a gain uh, because we can phase align the responses of the elements to point toward a specific direction. But uh, if in this specific direction, in addition to the target we are looking at, there is also a uh, Clutter, which means there are other objects from the environment which produce unwanted reflections. These unwanted reflections will uh, be captured by the RIS as well. So how we should optimize the RIS in the presence of clutter is uh, a big, uh, is still an unknown problem. Uh, of course, we you now you now know that. Um, a new type of RIS has been uh, uh, proposed where we are able to uh, um, simultaneously uh, reflect and uh, uh, transmit uh, the instant signal so we can have a, a full coverage of the space. So understanding how we can use such wave, such new type of uh, reflecting surfaces is an open problem in the context of radar applications. And as I mentioned you at the very beginning, uh, mutual coupling among the RAS elements should be accounted at some point in the model to see uh, how it affects the uh, ability of focusing the radar signal towards a the desired direction where the target is expected to be. So uh, I have concluded this part. So if you have any, there, there is a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much.
Um, so I was wondering if you have any ongoing uh, uh, problem formulations for the CRLB computation uh, at this point of time. Uh, any ongoing formulation for? Uh, for the first item, I mean, the camera lower bound. For, for the first item, uh, no, no. Well, I mean, we are starting looking at these open problems, but right now, uh, no initial results mm -hmm. yet available. Mm -hmm. Okay, because um, uh, in a similar set setting, I mean, in a communication setting, I was uh, like, I sort of started to work on this uh, CRLB for some RAS aided si uh, systems for uplink positioning. Um, I was going to say, if uh, you have anything go going on, uh, we might as well exchange some emails. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we can for sure, uh, uh, I mean, interact on this. I would be very happy. I mean, we can, uh, mm -hmm. uh, we can discuss uh, uh, later uh, with one-to-one uh, -one meeting. I mean, uh, just email me and we can arrange yeah, sure, sure. schedule. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's for sure an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So for the next part, uh, I will uh, pass. Okay, there is another me. question. Yeah, OK. Uh, sorry for the last question. In a slide number 24, I think. Yes, yep. yes, yes. Uh, the right figure. Why okay. is the, uh, the dashed one is not symmetric? No, when it's off of the transmitter, it's the SNR is less than the off of the okay. receiver. Uh, the, actually, the answer is in uh, the system parameters that we are using. So we did this on purpose. Uh, we, uh, I mean, here, the forward RIS and the backward RIS are the same. However, the transmit array and the receive array are different. Hmm. Okay, so we have three transmit antennas here and eight receive antennas here. This makes the system asymmetric. Oh, okay. okay. Of course, if you have the same number of transmit and receive antennas, and if you assume that element gain is the same of both the transmit and the receive side, you would observe a perfect symmetric. Uh, plot as you uh, argued and uh, this i think here in your in the risk radar scenario the true distance is important the distance between the near field and far field and the distance for the estimation yes yeah. and these two distance is overlapping yes or not i mean no these two distances in overlap in some level you know for example from one kilometer to 15 we are in the far field or near field and at the same time the estimation is like a 10 no. kilometer okay wait uh here there are two uh two distances one is the distance between the photo ris and the radar transmitter here delta okay okay this distance as you have seen in all figures is in the order of few meters mm. and uh, it is the ris and the radar that can be in the far field or in the near field depending on this distance and of course depending on the size of the ris as to the target the target is assumed here to be in the far field so the target is always in the far field. And okay. In fact, you see these, these are in the order of kilometers. Okay. Of course, I mean, here we have done an example of a, a long range surveillance radar, but uh, similar examples can be made on um, short range surveillance radars, where, for example, the distance between the transmitter and the radar is in the order of 100 meters rather than okay. kilometers. Thank you so much. I understand. Okay.
Okay, if you don't have other questions, I will pass the token to Emanuele for the next part. Okay, thanks, Luca. So, welcome back. So the next part of the talk will be concerned with the situation where, uh, oh, first of all, let me put the view in uh, presentation mode, where the uh, radar and RIS are widely separated. So if the radar and the RIS are widely separated, they actually act as a multi-static radar system. In a multi-static radar system or radar architecture, there are multiple transmitters and receivers that are widely separated. The configuration that we analyze here is the one depicted in this picture, this uh, figure, where the radar has one transmitter whose beam is pointed towards the prospective target and one receiver are X capable capable of forming two beams, one pointing towards the target and one pointed towards the RIS. The RIS which is widely separated. These two receive beams, the one pointing toward the target, so the one pointed toward the RIS, um, can be generated by the same antenna or by different antennas that do not have really to be related to be necessarily closely spaced among, among them, between them. A typical solution is indeed the one where the antenna pointing toward the targets is a phased array whose beam is steered in the direction as the transmit beam in the same direction as the transmit beam that is in turn used to scan the old volume to search for targets. The beam instead pointing towards the RIS can be fixed, so need not to be steered since the RIS is fixed in a specific location, a known position, and so it can be generated this beam by a low cost antennas Example classics, it can be a fixed uh, horn antenna looking at the RIS. The RIS is, is then used to redirect the um, backscatter signal from the target towards the, um, um, the, the radar. And if the radar is scanning, the RIS should be reconfigured each time a new sector is illuminated so that the receive beam of the RIS follows the transmit beam of the of the radar. While the angle departure of the RIS must be kept fixed in such a way it illuminates the radar receiver. Therefore, there are two looks at the target. One from the radar side and one from the RIS side. And since the radar and RIS are widely separated, this system mimics a multi-static radar where there is one transmitter at the radar side and two receiver receivers, one at the radar side and one at the RIS side. The fact that the uh, well, the advantage of this situation is clear. I mean, first of all, we now have an additional link to collect more energy backscatter from the target. And this is always beneficial. It results in an integration gain. Furthermore, we have two different aspect angles of the target. And since the RC, uh, uh, the radar cross section of the target varies as a function of the aspect angle, we now have angular diversity that can be exploited at the radar to, to improve the radar performance in a variety of ways, such as to improve the detection performance, the localization accuracy the target feature extraction process, etc. Here I will show you only how to how to um, how the races can be or an RIS can be 
successfully, uh, successfully uh, employed to improve the detection performance of the radar system. However, the disadvantages are equally clear. The indirect link passing toward DRIS is composed of two hopes, and the multiplicative path loss may be so severe to, to eat all the gain that we, oh, granted by the angular diversity, so that this link may, might be actually unusable. The solution is therefore to adopt an active RIS so that to be able not only to redirect the incident wave from the target towards the radar, but also to amplify it. The additional degrees of freedom um, granted by uh, the RIS amplification factors comes now, come now at the price of an additional power consumption that should be carefully taken into account in the power budget constraint. So, let us now give a better look at the system model. The radar antenna size is denoted as DR. DR. We could consider the size of the uh, all involved antennas at the radar, one at the transmitter side and two at the receiver side, but here, just to simplify the exposition, DR is just the largest antenna size. The uh, signal emitted by the radar as a wavelength lambda and a bandwidth W. The distances are denoted with the letter D and a subscript is added to differentiate among the different links. In particular, RT here stands for radar to target, TS for target to surface and SR from surface to target. To radar, sorry. The target as a the prospective target, since we don't know actually if the target is present, as a size DT, while the active RIS is a planar structure composed of uh, half wavelength spaced elements, and its size is DS. The size here is the largest linear extension in the three dimensional space. Okay, so it can be one side of the RIS. Finally, C here is the angle formed by the line segment joining the transmitter, the radar transmitter and the target, and the line segment joining the active RIS and the target. The following assumptions or conditions are uh, assumptions are made. Assumptions are made. First of the first assumption is the far field assumption. Indeed, we have talked about antenna beam so so far one tra two trans one transmit beam and two receive beams so if we talk about antenna beams then we must be in the far field the condition here is is just that the distance must be greater than twice the square dimension divided by lambda and so the first line just tell us that the radar is in the far field of the target and that the target is in the far field of the radar. Similarly, the second line tells us that the target, target is in the far field of the RIS and the RIS in the far, is in the far field of the, of the target. And finally, the last line tells us that the radar and the RIS are in each other's far field. The second assumption is the narrow band assumption, where we need that all the, 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 the time difference of arrival of the signal are not resolvable across the array elements. And this translates into a condition on the, of the size of the array that should be much smaller than C divided by two, by, divided by W, as we have seen into the, into, into, in the introductory slides. Here we need that the delays are not resolvable not only in the direct link from radar to target to radar, but also in the indirect link, radar, target, RIS, and radar back. So what comes here is therefore the sum of the dimensions of the RIS and of the, of the sizes of the RIS and of the radar. So this is the condition that we need to be satisfied. 
Finally, the third condition is this widely spaced condition so that the beams, the models, the target sp uh, scattering whose width, I want to remember you, is lambda by the dimension of the target, should be smaller than the angle xi, or, yeah, xi, so that we have angular diversity. The reason that, uh, why I'm stressing all these conditions is that sometimes if things are not properly checked, one may, may op might obtain huge gains that are actually not correct since that they, as they come from the application or model in a situation where that model actually is not correct. So where some assumptions are not actually met. Let us now model the amplitude coefficients uh, in all the involved links. They are denoted with the letter alpha with a subscript and uh, the subscript order remind, uh, determines the path direction. So alpha RT is the coefficient in the radar to target path, while alpha TR is the coefficient in the target to radar path. Alpha TS is for target to surface, and SR is for surface to radar. We also denote by G the antenna gains, and uh, the first, and we also add um, again a subscript with two letters, where the first letter is for the antenna, while the second letter is for the pointing direction, so that GRT is the gain of the radar towards the target, while GRS is the gain of the radar toward the surface. Also, we add a superscript, TX for the radar transmitter, and RX for the two receive beams. Finally, as to the RIS, the element scanes are denoted as GST and SR. So S stands for the surface and T is for the gain towards the target, R for the gains of each element of the RIS towards the radar. So with this notation and assuming reciprocity for the links, uh, for all the links, we have that the link budget coefficients takes this form here. As to the radar to target link, here you just see the standard link budget, the, 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 the gain of the transmit antenna divided by four pi distance squared. As to the target uh, radar link, we have the same free space propagation loss times the aperture effective area of the antenna. As to the coefficient from the target to the RIS, you are in the same situation. You have the free space propagation loss and the uh, effective area of the each element of the RIS. And finally, for the surface to radar link, you have the gain of the each element of the RIS divided by the free space propagation loss to get to the radar. And on the radar side, you have the effective area of the uh, radar receive antenna pointing towards the RIS. Although this is a certainly a simple model, it is sufficient to capture the main system's trade-off. Now, after baseband conversion, uh, matched filtering uh, to the transmit waveform and sampling, which is the standard, uh, let's say, uh, receive uh, standard radar processing, the received signal on the first uh, uh, link, the first uh, channel, that is the direct link, can be written in this form here, when a target is present. We have the average power emitted by the radar, evaluated over a processing interval T, the radar to, 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 the radar to target and target to radar uh, path, the unknown target response denoted here as gamma 1, which is a complex coefficient accounting for the unknown target response and the unknown phase response, and this term here that is just the, 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 the processing gain in this matched filtering uh, operation, which is the standard time bandwidth product. 
for future reference, we denote all this quantity here as alpha 1. Finally, we have the NOS term, which is modeled here as a complex circuit-symmetric Gaussian random variable with variance equal to the noise power P on the first channel. So we denote it, it as P W1. In the indirect link, we have three terms now, since we have an active RIS. The first one is the signal term, where we find the average radar transmit power, the radar to target coefficient, the unknown tag the response to our, towards the RIS. Notice that now this counts for the bi-static radar cross-section, since the uh, reflected wave bounces off with a different angle with respect to incident wave. So it's not the monostatic radar uh, cross-section that we have seen in the previous case. This is the bi-static radar cross-section. Then the channel, the, 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 the path coefficient from the target to the RIS, and then from the RIS to the radar. Including the time bandwidth product, we call this all uh, coefficient as alpha two. This term here is then amplified by each term of the um, RIS. So you also have the combination of all the uh, um, uh, links from each element of the RIS, the target, the target, each element of the RIS and the, and the radar, which are combined. So uh, each of them is amplified by a factor AL and phase shifted by a factor PhiL. Here, the terms uh, beta LR is the um, um, the phase shift for the uh, path from the radar from the surface L, L, L element of the RIS to the radar, while BT beta TL is the phase shift corresponding to the uh, traveled path from the target to the L element of the RIS. The third term here accounts for the noise on the second channel of the radar receiver, which is still modeled as a complex Gaussian sequence symmetric random variable. Finally, the second term here accounts for the noise introduced by each active element of the RIS. Specifically, VL is the so-called dy dynamic noise generated by the health element of the RIS. All these variables are modeled as IID Gaussian random variables with variance equal to the dynamic noise power. The noise term VL is then amplified by the uh, amplification factor AL, phase shifted by the factor PhiL, and then it has another phase shift due to the travel, uh, the travel path from the health element of the RIS to the radar receiver. And at the receiver, the receiver see all the super, super, superposition of this race, each one multiplied by the, 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 the path coefficient from the radar, uh, from the surface to the radar receiver. I want just to stress uh, one very important fact that the phase terms beta T L so from the targets to the element of the RIS are actually known. They are the first term of a steering vector pointing towards the expecting direction. Also, the phase terms beta L R, so from the surface, health, health element of the surface to the radar, are also known. They are again the phase shifts of a steering vector pointing towards the radar, which is located in a known position. Therefore, the RIS phase optimization problem is trivial. Each phase term phi L should be uh, designed so as to properly phase align all these signal components. And when you do this, uh, when you do this uh, um, phase optimization, the uh, 
receipt signal on the second on the second channel of the radar can be written in this simplified way where this uh, all contribution here denoted for simplicity as z2 is the overall noise which is still a gaussian random variable where its power is given by the power uh, its variance is given by the sum of the power of the noise at the radar receiver and the uh, dynamic noise amplified by the irs and attenuated by the channel from the rs to the radar okay at this point in order to be able to uh um, to, to, to set up uh, and uh, to optimize also the amplification factor of the RIS and the number of elements of the RIS, we need to um, consider a proper power consumption model. At the reader side, uh, the consumed power is modeled as the sum of the um, circuit power rho r needed to operate the transmitter and the radiated power of the radar PR amplified by the term eta r to the minus one, where eta r is just the, the efficiency of the amplifiers of the radar. This is a number between zero and one, so its inverse is greater than one. So you need a larger power to get PR, to radiate a power equal to PR. At the RAS side, we use a simple but reasonable model, and you may, may refer to this. Uh, reference for additional details. Specifically, the total power consumption of the RIS is just the sum of these two terms, this and this here. The first term is the total power needed to operate the RIS. Since it's composed of L elements, it's L times rho S, where rho, rho S is the power consumption needed to operate each element, which in, is in turn composed of two terms, the switch and control power PC and the DC power consumption PDC. The second term is the output power, all this term here, amplified by the inverse of the efficiency of the amplifier of each uh, uh, amplifiers of uh, of the uh, of each element of the RIS. The the, the 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 output power is clearly um, the fraction of power emitted by the radar, reflected by, back by the target, and attenuated by the path, which accounts from the path going from the radar to the target and from the target to the surface. So here you have the multiplicative path loss. And also you have the additional noise generated, the dynamic noise generated by each element of the RIS. Of course, all this noise is amplified by each element of the RIS. For future reference, we denote this quantity here as the overall attenuation from the radar to the target to the surface. Uh, finally, the total power consumption is just the sum of these two terms here, the power consumption of the reader and the power consumption of the RIS. So let us move on the system design. Uh, our aim is to detect the presence of a target. So we are faced with a testing problem where H1, again, is the note, the, the, the target presence hypothesis, and H0, the target absence hypothesis. And specifically, H1 is, again, a uh, composite hypothesis since the pair of radar uh, cross-section or target responses, gamma 1 towards the, um, the, 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 the radar and gamma 2 towards the RIS are unknown. There are many ways to tackle the composite hypothesis uh, testing problems, but in the following, we use the standard approach uh, to evaluate the ML estimates of the unknown target responses, and then we plug them in the likelihood function to ob obtain the generalized likelihood ratio, the generalized likelihood function. So the test is just 
obtained by uh, the ratio of these two generalized Lacue ratio functions. And well, it is not difficult to show that the, G, the generalized Lacue ratio test amounts to this included vector where the a properly scaled version of the two, the squared modulus of the signals from the two channels are summed and then compared with a threshold, which is the direction threshold gamma. If the threshold is crossed, you declare the, a target to be present. Otherwise, you say that there is no target in that position and you continue exploring the uh, volume, search the volume for additional targets. These scaling factors are just the two powers, noise power, of the two different uh, channels. So as to be able to probably uh, combine these two terms. In this case, the probability of false alarm admit a very simple and very well-known expression since the statistics under uh, the h not hypothesis that is only noise is just uh, uh, a key, uh, it has a key square distribution and the expression is this one here. As to the probability of uh, detection, nothing can be said until you do not model the uh, radar cross-section of the target, that is the target responses. If we assume that they can be modeled as complex Gaussian uh, random variables with uh, variances equal to the radar cross-section, the monostatic radar cross-section, so from the radar to the target to the radar, and the bistatic radar cross-section from the radar to the, uh, to, the, to the target to the surface, and you know, uh, a Gaussian complex Gaussian model means uh, uh, the standard uh, swelling case one model. And if these two coefficients are independent, and they are, since we are assuming that the targets are widely separated, then the probability of detections admit a, a simple closed form expression, which is reported here. Since basically this square modulus is exponential. Uh, is exponentially distributed, and also this is exponentially distributed, and the mean value of this term is one plus the SNR at the first channel, while the mean value of this term is just one plus the SNR at the second channel, the indirect link. The two SNRs are reported here. Since the sum of two exponential random variables independent but not identically distributed, since the two uh, SNRs are different, since they have different propagation paths and different rather cross sections, uh, but nevertheless, they are two uh, independent exponential random variables. The sum of independent exponential random variables follows a hypo exponential distribution. And you might write down the probability of direction which admits this closed form expression in the special case of two channels. Let us move on the, on the system design. So our goal is to maximize the probability of detection uh, since we want to optimize the performance um, uh, detection performance of the radar with a fixed probability of false alarm. Notice that the fixed probability of false alarm is uh, given or is fixed once you set the detection threshold. So you set the detection threshold and the probability of false alarm is determined. And so with the gamma fixed, you have the probability of detection that sh should be optimized over the remaining parameters. The, the, the degrees of freedom are the, are the radar power, uh, are the, uh, the, um, are the radar, the number of RIS elements are L, the RIS amplification factors uh, uh, cast here in the unique vector A, and the constraints are on the power budget, the total power budget P max, the maximum number of RIS elements, L max, and the maximum application factor, A max. The problem is then that of maximizing the probability detection under these constraints here. And unfortunately, the problem is quite complex, but uh, uh, a suboptimal solution can actually be found if we resort to the block coordinates and method. In this case, we alternate between the two maximization, 
we maximize over the, uh, the radar power PR with the, the uh, amplification factor of the RS and the number of RS elements kept fixed. And then we maximize over these two terms, L and A, when the power of the radar side is kept fixed. And for these two sub-problems, fortunately, we have a closed form solution. Let us move, move on the performance analysis. This is the system that we uh, consider, uh, where the radar is located at the uh, origin of the Cartesian axis. The um, prospective target is located at five, uh, 50 meters in front of the radar on the x-axis, and the RIS is placed in position 200 minus 200 meters. The carrier wavelength is 10 centimeters. The signal bandwidth is 10 megahertz, which corresponds to a resolution of 15 meters. And the process interval for the uh, mesh filter is 0 0.5 milliseconds. The gains of the radar beams are all equal to 33 dBs. And the gains of the uh, RIS elements is fixed and equal to 3 dBs. So basically, they are omnidirectional in the uh, in the half of the of the of the of the plane illuminated by or seen by the RIS. The RIS is a square surface with a maximum number of elements of 2,500, and different maximum application factors are considered, ranging from 10 to 40 dBs. Uh, the total power budget is 4 watts. So the situation, the situation we are looking at here is that of a small radar covering a small region and where uh, 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 an RIS helps the radar. And given the low cost of the RIS, they can even be larger than the radar itself and can be suitably placed, for example, in the on the facade of, of, of a building. The probability of false alarm is 10 to the minus 6. And for the sake of comparison, we will compare the performance with the case where no the radar operates alone. And we refer to this case as no risk case. In this case, all the power is devoted to the RIA, uh, to, the, to the radar, and so the emitted power is just uh, the old total power budget minus the power needed to operate the transmitter times the amplification factor, uh, the, the, the power efficiency of the amplifiers. We also compare the results with the passive RIS, and all curves are reported as a function of, of SNR0, which is the SNR in the no risk case, no RIS case where the target strength, which is unknown, is varied so that we have different values of the SNR. We also consider two uh, cases, a mesh design where the radar cross-section of the uh, target is known and used in the project, in the design, and a mismatched case where this radar cross-section is not known, which is the standard situation. And in this case, we set equal to a design value and we accept losses in case of mismatch. The design value we choose is uh, the radar cross-section that gives us a probability detection equal to 0 0.5, which is something in the middle. So this is the first figure where we show the optimized probability detection as a function of the SNR. And uh, we can see that the black line is the no, no RIS case, and the red line is the passive RIS, which is um, which is um, uh, useful only for very high SNRs, greater than 20.5 dBs, where the indirect link is uh, sufficiently strong that diversity is helpful. At lower SNR, it is much better to devote all the available power and resources to the best link, that is the direct one, to maximize the integration gain. When the active RIS used, uh, the blue curves, solid line, in the 10 dB amplification gain case, then uh, we have a similar behavior as in the passive RIS case. Um, while for the 20 to 40 dBs amplification gain, uh, the uh, performance of the uh, RIS uh, radar 
is uh, really, really the, the, the performance is significantly is, is a significantly better than the reader along case. Notice here the blue curves are both steeper, which means that there is a diversity order, a diversity order of two granted by the two looks, independent looks of the target, and uh, uh, shifted toward the right, which means that there is an integration gain thanks to the additional uh, uh, energy integrated by the additional link available. Finally, the plus markers are used to refer the, to the mismatched case where the, uh, the rare cross section of the target is unknown. As, as you can see, uh, the performance loss uh, with respect to the matched case is almost negligible. This figure instead uh, reports the optimization, uh, optimized reader power. And recall that the total power budget is 4 watts, but 2 watts are needed to operate the radar transmitter. And the amplifier efficiency is just 8, uh, 0 0.8 in the system settings we have seen before. So that the in the risk, no, no risk case, uh, the, 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 the radiated power of the radar is 1.6 watts. From the previous plot, it is seen that the RIS is activated here at around 20.5 dBs. And when the RIS is, uh, the passive RIS is activated, then uh, the, the, the some part, some portion of the of the of the power is devoted from is 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 used to operate the RIS. Uh, the active RIS case uh, is uh, is here represented by the blue line, and the 10 dB uh, amplification factor case behaves very similar to the uh, passive RIS case. Here, indeed, the signal amplification is not sufficient to cope with the severe um uh, product path loss along the indirect uh, target uh, ris radar hope if instead the maximum amplification gain is 20 to uh, 40 dbs uh, we can see that the average radar power is something like 0 0.8 0 0.9 d watts interesting interestingly as the snr not increases the power is slightly moved from the radar from the from the from the from the RIS towards the radar side, and the, the subsequent figure will uh, give us um, a motivation or justification of this behavior. Since essentially uh, this is due to the fact that the number of activity elements of the RIS is reduced. Indeed, in this last figure where we report the optimized number of RIS elements, it is seen that the when the passive RIS uh, is used, after 20 dBs, all the antenna elements of the RIS should be used and should be activated. And again, the active RIS case with amplification factor equal to 10 dBs behaves very similar to the passive RIS. And as you was observed in the previous figure uh, in the active RIS case for amplification uh, um, for maximum amplification factor greater than 20 dBs, the number of activated RIS elements slightly decreases as the SNR. So that's why here you have additional power devoted to the radar as the SNR increase. The intuition here is that once the RIS amplification a factor uh, or amplification gain is uh, already sufficient or sufficiently large to well counteract the uh, product path loss of, along the indirect link then it, be, it becomes more and more uh, rewarding to switch off some more and more RIS elements and to move the power towards the radar transmitter so so as to better illuminate the target I will skip this uh, slide since I feel we are in a, a, bit, a, a little bit late. And I will move to the last slides where few, few open problems are reported here. Indeed, there are a number of open problems that can be studied in this case. And specifically, the problem of optimum RIS positioning could be studied. Also, the case where there are multiple RIS and multiple targets uh, that, uh, that, that in, in the scene, multiple RIS that need to, to help multiple radars, um, multiple uh, to, to 
related to, to, to try to detect the multiple targets. Uh, another important aspect is when uh, the one where concerning the noise power, which is been which has been considered here known, but uh, in general it is not known, must be estimated. And also the clutter power. The clutter, remember, is the unwanted reflection from the environment. Uh, and it should be included as a sort of source of, of source of disturbance and should be itself estimated and finally uh, radars are not only used to, to detect the target but also to estimate the, uh, their features and to attract them so therefore a, therefore a quite interesting um, problem is the one where the RIS must be optimized to, optimized to jointly improve the detection and estimation performance of the radar system and this closes the the part concerning the widely separated and radar uh, and ris so we'll give back the uh, stage to luca are there any questions on this maybe we, <laughs> we people are really uh, tired you know tired you know afternoon and a long talk okay let me Let me share my screen. Okay. Okay, in this final part of this talk, uh, I want to quickly uh, introduce you uh, quite recent, some, some recent results that we have in the context of radar-enabled communications. Uh, so which is the motivation here? So you know that now there is, uh, a major interest in developing integrated sensing and communication solutions and technologies. And up to now, we have seen uh, quite many uh, solutions to allow integrated sensing and communication, ranging from physical coexistence between two autonomous systems which have a dedicated radar transceiver and a dedicated communication transceiver with different level of coordination, up to the most recent concept of dual function radar communication, where is we have just the only one active transceiver and two receive chains, one dedicated to the communication function, the other one to the radar function. Uh, there is another uh, way to allow integration between these two systems, which uh, is, uh, which uh, actually exploits the use of uh, electromagnetic signals that we already have in the environment. Along this line, we uh, have seen that uh, existing communication signals can be, for example, used to implement passive or opportunistic radars. And uh, on the dual side, we could make use of existing radar signals to implement some form of ambient best scatter communication. And this is the, uh, in this final part of this talk, I want to uh, discuss with you uh, the uh, ambient best scatter communication philosophy using radar signals. So, few words about ambient best scattered communication. Actually, this 
uh, idea is quite old. It dates back to the 40s, and it's an idea put forward by Stockman. Uh, an idea is to use a uh, low power modulator to reflect an ambient carrier upon changing uh, some parameters of this carrier, like, for example, the amplitude of the phase to superimpose a message. In the context of ambient backscatter communication, the uh, backscatter device is usually referred to as a tag while the backscatter receiver is usually referred to as a reader. And in the following, I will uh, use this uh, common notation of tag and reader. So this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this idea has been uh, used, for example, to uh, allow short-range data transmission in a number of Internet of Things applications. Uh, but most of the work, I mean, actually, uh, the majority of the work so far have mainly focused on the use uh, of electromagnetic signals emitted by communication sources. So we have an existing communication signal that we reuse to send a message through ambient scattered communication. Well, now the question is, can we actually use an existing radar signal to send a message through ambient backscatter communication? Well, as we will see, the answer is yes. But before going to that, I want to point out the connection between ambient backscatter communication and the, ref the intelligent ref the, 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 the use of RIS. So how RIS comes into play when we have ambient backscatter well, first thing to notice is that uh, a backscatter device and an RIS actually share the same reflective principle. They both uh, take an incoming electromagnetic signal and they reflect it back towards some destination. So in this sense, these two devices are quite similar in terms of uh, in uh, implementation of technology. Uh, how can we use an RIS? Well, in principle, we could use an RIS as a helper to boost the link between a tag and a reader, which is what you see here in the left of this slide. But more interesting, we could use an RIS as a tag itself. So the RIS can be used to uh, capture some electromagnetic signals present in the environment and to change some of their properties in order to modulate on top of these uh, signals a message, which must be sent towards a reader. So we can use an RIS actually as a backscatter modulator. Now, uh, let me directly skip to the core of our uh, recent research studies. Our idea is to exploit uh, existing signals emitted by a radar in order to modulate, in order to uh, deliver a message from a tag to a reader. So here, consider the system configuration that we have shown on this slide. So we have a radar. This radar is operating uh, alone, is not aware of the presence of the tag, is not aware of the presence of the reader, is just doing its business without bothering about what the tag the reader here wants to do. So this radar illuminates the environment in order to detect surrounding objects or in order to uh, estimate the and, uh, to estimate the parameters of such objects so every time the radar emits a signal such signal can directly reach our tag but can also hit other objects present in the environment and reach the tag we refer to the uh, ensemble of ECOS hitting the tag has the radar clutter. 
Well, the idea is that this radar clutter, which is generated by the environment in response to the signal emitted by the radar, can be used as a carrier signal. And uh, on top of this carrier signal, we could actually modulate the message to be sent to the reader. Uh, the major challenge here is that the radar clutter is here both a friend, as it provides an unbound carrier, but also full, since this radar clutter also hits the reader, and at the reader, the radar clutter is nothing but interference. So the reader will receive the ensemble of echoes generated by the radar, plus the message modulated by the TAC. So I will give you more detail on this in a moment. So the idea is we want to exploit the radar clutter as a carrier signal. And we want to do this in a such a way that the same radar clutter at the reader is not uh, is not uh, uh, causing too much problem. Okay, so which are our design assumptions? So here we assume that the radar transmitter emits a periodic signal. And we call the period of this signal by T sub A. But this is quite a general assumption, as we know that radar does emit periodic signals in most of their for, for accomplish most of their functions. So this is quite a general assumption, which can be uh, uh, which is satisfied for most radars. Uh, the second assumption that we make is that uh, the response of the environment do not change over few radar periods. Uh, the number of radar periods over which the response of the environment remains constant is denoted by L. So L times TA, the period, is what we call the coherence time of the environmental response. And such an interval in the following will be referred to as a frame. So our goal is to exploit the structure of the radar clutter over a frame to send a message. Uh, during a frame, the backscatter modulator, which can be, as I said, an RIS, uh, can change the properties of the incoming signals generated by the environment. And for example, we can change the phase of the amp and or, and or the amplitude of such signals. We assume that during each radar period, we send a given number of data symbols. We denote the number of data symbols by NA. So within one radar period, we want to send NA data symbols. The last assumption that we make is that tag and reader are synchronized among each other. We make no other assumptions, which means that in what follow, we have no information on which is the radar waveform. And also, we have no information about the surrounding environment, which means that the radar tag reader and the radar reader channels are unknown. The only information that we exploit is the fact that the coherence time of this channel is known and spans L radar periods. That's the only assumption that we are going to exploit later on. So this is an example of what is going on at the talk. So let me start describing the 
figure at the top. This is an example of a cladder realization. And I'm showing here two periods of the radar cladder hitting the top. And as you can see, over these two periods, the cladder repeats itself. Now, as I said, the tag wants to send some data symbols. Assume that we want to send four data symbols over one radar period. So we have this first symbol here. We have this second symbol here and so on. We allow a guard interval between two data symbols. And this guard interval will be is needed, as I will show you later, to avoid inter-symbol interference at the reader. So what we do is we use a switch inside the tag to modulate the incoming radar plotter. So when we want to send this first symbol, we uh, activate our switch and therefore we load our symbol on the incoming clutter, as you can see in the bottom plot. Then the switch is off and the tag remains silent during the guard interval. Then the switch is on again and we load a new symbol on the incoming carrier signal and so on. So at the end of this modulation process, what is reflected by the tag is a modulated version of the radar cladder hitting the backscatter modulator. Okay. So as you can see, <coughs> uh, we have a sequence of pulses. Each pulse carries a different symbol. What I want to point out is that we do not know the carrier signal, but what we know is that the carrier signal repeats itself over two radial periods. So in this sense, when I look at the first symbol that I'm sending here, I actually have no idea about what, what is the pulse carrying my symbol. But what I know is that the pulse carrying this symbol is actually the same as the pulse carrying this symbol here after one radar period. This is what we are going to exploit. So what we do at the receiver side, at the reader? Well, at the reader, what we have is a delayed version of the signal backscatter by the tag eventually scaled by a factor beta accounting for the propagation loss, plus the radar interference I, plus the noise. This is what the antenna of the reader is receiving. What we do is we do some low pass filtering to remove the out of bandwidth noise. And we want to make sure that we choose the guard interval in order to avoid inter-symbol interference at the output of this low pass filter. After this low pass filtering operation, what we do is just standard sampling. So we sample the output at a rate Ks divided by Ts, where Ks where TS is the symbol interval and KS is the number of samples we take in one symbol interval. Uh, what is important here is that we have three different time scales. Okay. One time scale is the one provided by the radar period. So here the index P counts the radar periods. A second time scale is the one related 
to the symbols that we send in each radar period. So within each radar period, we send an A symbol. And we use the index N to count the number of symbol within each radar period. Finally, for each symbol, we have a given number of samples, KS. So we use lowercase k to count the number of samples corresponding to each symbol. So in the next slide, I'm going to give you a graphical description of this. So on the top, I'm just showing you the output of the low pass filter. I'm just showing the component corresponding to the signal backscattered by the tag. So here I have a first pulse carrying the symbol XP0. This is the first data symbol sent during the radar period P. Then I have another pulse, sorry, sending the symbol XP1. So this is the second symbol sent during the radar period P and so on. Okay. Oops. Then we have the second radar period. And now the subscript becomes P plus one. So this is the continuous time output of the filter. What we do is sampling this output. And when we sample this output, what we get? Well, we get a sequence of samples as shown at the bottom of this slide. Now, first notice that within each symbol interval only few samples are non-zero as consequence of the presence of the guard interval next here you see p is counting the red so, uh, here we are showing two radial periods one indexed by p and the other one indexed by p plus one Within each radar period, we have four symbol interval corresponding to n equal to 0, n equal to 1, n equal to 2, and e n equal to 3. And then again, n equal to 0, n equal to 1, n equal to 2, and then n equal to 3. Within each radar period, we have some non-zero data samples that we, uh, that, uh, we can process. Okay. So what I want to point out is that the carrier samples that we have here are equal to the carrier samples that we have here because the radar clutter is periodic. So these carrier samples only differ for the different symbols that they uh, carries. Similarly, the samples that we have here up to the data symbol are equal to what we have here, and so on. OK, so what's the trick? We want to look at one frame, okay? In one frame, we have L radar periods. We index these L radar periods as shown here, okay? So we start from lowercase L times capital L, plus one, plus two, plus L minus one. So these are capital L consecutive radar periods which in each radar period, we focus on a particular symbol interval, which is referred to as subchannel. Okay. In each radar period, we look at the same symbol interval. And within this simple interval, we are taking K samples. In each symbol interval, remember, we have the same carrier pulse modulating a different data symbol. We can organize all our samples into a matrix. 
The size of this matrix is L, the number of red arc periods we are considering, times K, the number of samples in each symbol interval. And uh, it can be shown that this matrix has a very nice structure. So it is the sum of three terms. So let me start from the last term, the noise. Very simple. You can imagine this as a matrix with Gaussian entries. Then what we have? Well, here, the first term is the signal received by the TAC. The vector X contains the capital L data symbols, which are sent over a frame by the TAC. And uh, since here we are looking at a particular subchannel, all these symbols will modulate the same pulse. And the vector alpha here co just contains the samples of the pulse, which, are, which is carrying all these data symbols. So overall, this term will be a rank one matrix, where the first vector is the vector of data symbol, and the second vector is the vector of the same of the uh, is, is the vector containing the, the samples of the carrier signal. The second term here is the interference that the reader received from the tag from the, from the reader. Notice that this term is also rank one matrix, which has a similar structure as to the first term. The only difference is that the vector here is the all one vector because in each radar period, the interference received by the radar remains the same. Okay. Now, which is the trick? Here we would like to recover the message X given the observation that we have without knowing this vector alpha, because we don't know a carrier signal, and without knowing this vector i, because this is the radar interference. So if we derive the maximum likelihood decoding rule for this, we end up with uh, this decoding strategy. So we want to take the output of our filter at the reader. We want to project it on the orthogonal complement of subspace spanned by the interference. And then we want to find the code word U chosen among a given code book, which maximize the projection along this interference-free signal. Uh, I don't have much time left. I just want to uh, give you some uh, general ideas. You can then find the uh, details in our paper, which is mentioned here in the slide. How do we choose the codebook that has to be employed by the TAC? Well, First of all, we should avoid using code words which uh, send signal in the subspace spanned by the interference. Because any power that we send in the subspace spanned by the radar interference gets wasted. So all the code words we want to use here in this model must be orthogonal to the all one vector. That way we make our message distinguishable by the radar interference at the reader. Also, since here the carrier signal is unknown, uh, we cannot distinguish 
parallel code words. So we can only distinguish code words by looking at the direction they point toward. So we must build a code book containing vectors pointing in different directions, which are orthogonal to the whole one vector. Uh, it seems a complicated game, but at the end, I can tell you that a very simple strategy is just to take the Hadamard matrix and use the columns of the Hadamard matrix as code words, except the all one, uh, the all one vector. This is an example of code book that we can have. Of course, if we have this choice, all the code words we are using are orthogonal to each other, which make them easily distinguishable. But we can relax this orthogonality condition. We can allow some degree of correlation among the code words. Of course, the more the code words becomes correlated, the worse the performance that we can have. Uh, I'm going to skip these details. Uh, I want just to show you one specific example. Uh, uh, here we assume Gaussian noise. Uh, we assume that the clutter as a non-central chi-square density uh, with, uh, 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 with a node by sigma square alpha, the mean value of this density, and also with a node by k sub alpha, the ratio between the specular deterministic component and the diffuse random component. Uh, in terms of communication model, this resembles the RISE model that you are familiar with. Most of you, I think, you are familiar with, with the RISE model. Uh, this is an example of performance we can obtain. So here we have two values of L. So we are processing eight radar periods corresponding to the solid line and 16 radar periods corresponding to the dashed line. And uh, we consider different values for the parameter cap, K, uh, cap alpha, uh, 1 over 9, 1 and 9. So in this first case, uh, we have a weak line of uh, a weak deterministic component. And in this case, we have a strong deterministic component. And as you can see, as the parameter K sub alpha uh, increases, we have better performance. Of course, it's better to have strong deterministic component in the signal hitting the, uh, the tag. And also what you can see is that if you can process more radar periods, you are able to uh, collect more energy from the environment and therefore you have an SNR, an SNR gain. Uh, what I can tell you is that we can extend this technique where we have multiple uh, tags, which can use different code books. In this case, we have a source multiple access or the same code book. In this case, we have an unsourced multiple access. And of course, we may have collision if two tags select the same message. Uh, that's it. So I don't want to add more details. Uh, just sum up briefly what we have seen so far, and then uh, we have, I mean, probably time for a few more questions. Uh, we have uh, we have seen that RIS can be effectively used in radar applications. We can use this RIS in close proximity of a radar transceiver to help uh, either the transmitter or the receiver to better focus the energy toward uh, the expected location. Or we can use a widely spaced active RIS to take advantage of the angular diversity. Or finally, we can also use RIS to uh, exploit the uh, existing reverberation from the environment 
generated from a radial transmitter and use such uh, a reverberation, such a radial clutter, as a carrier signal to convey a message. Well, these are some ideas. Hopefully, you will come up with uh, better ideas. Uh, and uh, we are here to answer your questions. And uh, of course, uh, you can also contact us in the next days for more details about what we have discussed so far.